Jesus Christ. Grab your pen, your notebook, and your Bible. You can be seated with your sweet, smart self as we get into the word of his grace. Glory to God. Mm -mm -mm. Amen. All right. Mm -mm. We're still in our series, Wisdom for Living. Wisdom for Living. And we began to examine the relationships of the new creation. The relationships of the new creation. You know, like I said on Sunday, many believers don't know how to go about relationships. Because now you are born again, you are a new creature or a brand new species of being that never existed before. And so now you have to confront relationships and as a new man in Christ Jesus, the word of God is the wisdom of God. The word of God is the wisdom of God. And of course, God is wiser than us. So, whatever God tells us to do is what we should do. Because he is the all-wise God. And in examining the wisdom of God, let's read our scripture or our main scripture for this study. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 17. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse number 17. Therefore... If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. He's a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are new. The previous verse drives home the point. Verse 16 of the same Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 16. Wherefore, Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yet though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Give me the amplified, the AMPC, amplified translation of that same verse 16. Consequently, from now on, we estimate and regard no one from a purely human point of view, in terms of natural standards of value. No, even though we once did estimate Christ from a human viewpoint and as a man, yet now we have such knowledge of him that we know him no longer in terms of the flesh. That means the minute you are in Christ, the way we estimate and value people has to change. Henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. In Ephesians chapter 4 verse 24, Ephesians chapter 4 verse number 24, the scripture tells us, and that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So, if you are in Christ, you are a new creature. How are you in Christ? When you believe the gospel. The moment you believe the gospel, you are a new creation. A new creation means a new breed or a new race or a new species of being. First Peter chapter 2 verse 9, brother Peter expands further on that. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who had called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are a peculiar breed, a new race. So the man who is born again is born of the spirit of God. He is a peculiar person. He is no longer from the natural point of view. He is from the scriptural point of view. And the scriptures views the born again man as a son of God. First John chapter 3 verse number 2. First John chapter 3 verse number 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. We shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. So that means when you got born again, 
Now you are a brand new man. You are a species of being that never existed before. So the way you handle relationships will have to differ from the way you used to handle relationships before you got born again. Now you are born again. You are born into a family. You have a new family. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 and 19. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 and 19. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the father. Next verse. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners. But fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of faith. Give me the amplified version of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18 and 19. The amplified. We're going to use the amplified a lot in this series. For it is through him that we both, whether far, whether far off or near, now have an introduction, access by one Holy Spirit to the Father. So that we are able to approach him. Next verse. Therefore, you are no longer outsiders, exiles, migrants, and aliens. Excluded from the rights of citizens. But you now share citizenship with the saints, God's own people, consecrated and set apart for himself. And you belong to God's own household. So there's a household now. It is called the household of God. Just like you have the household of Inyang Ete. You have the household of Mr. Akman. Alright? So it means you have a singular parentage. A singular parentage. So the same way when you get saved, you are now in a household. It is called the household of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 3 verse number 14. Ephesians chapter 3 verse number 14. Please pay attention. For this cause I bow my knees unto the father of, the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ. I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So there's a Christian family in heaven. And the people in the heavenly family are those who have gone to heaven before us. Or those who have slept in Christ. Then there is another family on earth. The family in heaven and on earth. The word whole family there means there is just one family. We may have many churches like Power City, like Christ Embassy, like the Household of Love, Winner's Chapel. All of those are names. We are one family. Anyone who is born again is born into that family. When you got saved, you were not saved into Power City. Power City is only an organization of believers who gather together for training to reach out to others, to grow spiritually, and get more people to join this family. You are actually in a family that is headed by God the Father. So the day you got born again, you are in that family which is now in heaven and on earth. That means anyone who has believed the same message is now your brother and sister in Christ. Anyone that has believed the message of his death, burial, resurrection, ascension, glorification is now your brother and sister in Christ. So, we are now brethren. The word brethren in the Greek is sharing common parents. That is, we now share common parents. The Jews used to use it. The Jewish people. They use men and brethren. Why do they use such terms? Because they all came from Abraham. That is why they call themselves brethren. But you see, 
is a type and shadow of what we now have in Christ Jesus. They were calling themselves brethren as a type and shadow of the reality that we now have in Christ. Because all of us came from Jesus. So, we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. We are one big family. It's not a title. When you call somebody brother, or when you call somebody in the house of God, sister, or when you look at somebody and say, my brother, it's not a title at all. It is more than a title. It's actually a relationship that we have now. It's a relationship that we have now. So, when you call someone brother, brother Akwan, brother Sonny, brother Udo, when you call someone brother Jerome, it's not just respect you are giving him, it's acknowledging that we are actually brothers and sisters in the Lord. But that's the relationship we are born into. When you look at somebody and you say, Brother Humphrey. When you call somebody, Sister Moss. Brother Matthew. What you are acknowledging is that actually we are brothers and sisters in the Lord. That is our genuine, our real relationship. That is our original relationship because you are born into a relationship with God. God now is your father. God now is your father. Jesus also your mediator, your advocate and now you carry on your inside the indwelling of the spirit. You carry on your inside the indwelling of the spirit. You are actually born into a relationship with fellow believers. You are born into a relationship with fellow believers. Look at 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. 1 John chapter 1 verse 1 to 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. Next verse. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. That which we have seen and heard, declare we unto you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, and truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So we all have a common fellowship with the Father and with Jesus. I repeat again, look up to me. We all have a common fellowship with the Father and with Jesus. We all have a heritage that is the same. We have a heritage that is the same. We now are brethren in Christ. We are brethren in Christ. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 17. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 17. Honor all men. Love the brotherhood. Underline brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the king. It means respect people. But much more the brotherhood. That word brotherhood, it's, it's, it's a very strong word in the Greek. Look at 1 Peter 2.17, the Amplified. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 17, the Amplified Version. <clears throat> Show respect for all men. Treat them honorably. Love the brotherhood, the Christian fraternity, of which Christ is the head. Reverence God, honor the emperor. He calls it the Christian fraternity. That's the original Greek. It's like a cult. 
but not a secret cult. Our brotherhood is like a cult, a fraternity, but not a secret cult. That is, we have been bonded in Christ. He says, love the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. You know, a fraternity is a family. We are bonded and bound together in Christ Jesus. We are bonded and bound together in Christ Jesus. He says to love that relationship. Love the brotherhood. How are we brethren? By salvation. How are we brethren? By salvation. That is anyone who has believed the message of Jesus Christ becomes your brother and your sister. Anyone who has believed the message of Jesus Christ becomes your brother and your sister. Let me show you a typical example of that. In Acts chapter 9, there's a fellow called Saul of Tarsus. If you follow the, 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 the story, it started from chapter 7 and 8. You read about Saul of Tarsus, where the Bible says, uh, when they were killing Stephen in chapter 6, and seven when they were killing Stephen Saul was like the supervisor of the killing of Stephen the Bible says they laid their clothes at a young man's feet whose name is Saul that is they removed their clothes and kept it at Saul's feet before they killed Stephen because he was like the supervisor and then from there they took off but in chapter 9 of Acts chapter 9 verse 1 to 3. Acts chapter 9 verse 1 to 3. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, next verse, and desired of him later to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he, that if he found any of this way, Christianity is called this way because Jesus is the way. Any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. So he was going round to persecute the church. In Philippians chapter 3, the same Saul said, he zealously persecuted the church and wasted it. He was talking about himself. He said, I zealously persecuted the church and wasted it. Now in Acts chapter 9, Jesus now appears to Saul and appears to Ananias. Look at that Acts chapter 9 verse 9 to 12. Acts chapter 9 verse 9. We'll have a little long read. And it was three days without sight and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, behold, I am here, Lord. Next verse. And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the street, which is called straight. And inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. Next verse. And had seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in. And putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Next verse. Then Ananias answered, Lord, Lord, I have heard by many of this man. How much evil he had done to thy saints at Jerusalem. 14. <clears throat> and there he had authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Look at verse 17. Now pay attention. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house. And putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul. 
brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Why did he call him brother Saul? Because he has believed in Jesus. Initially, he called him this man. I have heard of this man. But now, because he has believed the gospel, he is called brother Saul. He is now a Christian. He is now born again. He is now your brother. Remember, he was a young man. But now, he is brother Saul. Brother means, you are now my brother in Christ. Look at something interesting in Acts 9. When Jesus appears to Saul, before he got saved, notice, Jesus says to him, Acts chapter 9 verse 3. Look at what Jesus says to him before he got saved. Acts 9 3. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shine round about him a light from heaven. Next verse. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul. That's how Jesus called him before, before he got born again. Saul, Saul. Why persecutest thou me? Persecute means to bring difficulty or opposition against someone. You wonder how and where. Look at Acts chapter 9 verse 5. <clears throat> Acts chapter 9 verse 5. And he said, who art thou Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. You know, the reason why he said, I am Jesus whom you persecute is because Jesus and the church are one. Jesus and the church are one. As you have come into oneness with Jesus, Jesus is also one with you. So, if you are one with Jesus, if you are one with Christ, you are bound together with everybody who has believed the gospel. Who is one with Christ. That means we belong to the same father. Jesus his father is our father. Jesus' inheritance is our inheritance. Jesus' body is ours. So Jesus' brethren are ours. So they now belong to you. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Please pay attention. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles. Whether we be bond or free. And have been all made to drink into one spirit. So anyone persecuting Christians was persecuting Jesus. Anyone who was insulting Christians was insulting Jesus. He didn't have to see Jesus physically. But when you see his brethren, he is there. Anywhere you find the brothers of Jesus, Jesus is there. Jesus is in the church. Glory to God. Jesus is in the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 to 13. For as the body is one and hath many members... And all the members of that one body, be many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, salvation. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. So we are one body in Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, Brother Paul begins to talk about, you know, uh, about fellow believers and how we treat them. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 verse 1. 
<clears throat> now, as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge perfect up, but charity edifieth. Give me verse 7 of the same chapter. How be it, there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. And their conscience being weak is defiled. Some brothers in Christ don't know what you know in Christ. So they are weak. So he says to you in verse 8 that this, there are things we can avoid for the sake of others. Look at verse 8 of that chapter. <clears throat> but meat commended us not to God. For neither if we eat are we the better. Neither if we eat not are we the worse. It doesn't mean that it's a sin in itself. But if you take it without regarding your brother in Christ, it becomes a sin. Look at verse, verse, verse 9, verse 9 of that same chapter. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. That is, you make somebody else to sin. Look at verse 10. <clears throat> Actually, 10 to 12. For if any man see thee which has knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you sin so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. That is, you are making people sin. You wound their conscience, and by wounding their conscience, you have sinned against Christ. Look at verse 13 of the same chapter. Verse 13. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. That means we consider our brethren above our knowledge. Relationship in God's word supersedes knowledge. That's what brother Paul is communicating here to the church. We are in a family of God. We must consider people who are saved as our responsibility. Why? They are our brethren. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 22 to 28. Ephesians 5, 22 to 28. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church and is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the world, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot, or recall, or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Next verse. So ought men to love their wives even as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. He that loves his wife loves himself. 29. Mm -mm. Verse 29. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it even as the Lord, the church. Even as the Lord, the church. If your Bible was mine, I will underline, even as the Lord, the church. Look at verse 30 and 31. Mm -mm. For we are members of his body and of his flesh and of his bones. 31. Ephesians 5, 31. 
For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife and they too, they too shall be one flesh. They too shall be one flesh. That is Genesis 2, 23 to 24. He was quoting, brother Paul was quoting from Genesis chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. Now give me that same Ephesians 5.32 now. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. So the relationship of Christ and the church is a substance. Listen carefully. The relationship of Christ and the church is a substance of the relationship between a husband and wife. The relationship of Christ and the church is a substance of the relationship between husband and wife. That is, that commitment, that oneness we find in marriage is a shadow of the oneness we have in Christ. The oneness in marriage is a shadow of the oneness we have in Christ. My fellow brother in Christ is like my flesh and blood. That tango between husband and wife is secondary to that of brethren in Christ. That tango, that bond between a natural husband and wife is secondary to the bond that we have as brethren in Christ. We are actually one. We have one identity in God. If you hate a brother, you hate yourself. Christians are your brothers. From Ephesians chapter 5, he's showing you that our spiritual relationship supersedes our earthly relationship. Our spiritual relationship supersedes our earthly relationship. Some of us don't know. We don't know that when we, when we come into Christ, that the relationship we have with our fellow believers is stronger than your earthly family. Your relationship with your brother in Christ is stronger than your earthly family's relationship. Because you see, the relationship you have with your family, mother, brother, is respected by God. Treat it with honor and respect. But you see, it's earthly. It's an earthly relationship. It does not go beyond this earth. You and your siblings, your relationship is just on earth. It doesn't go beyond this earth. So your relationship with your mother, your father, your natural brothers, is for this earth. But the one we have with brothers in Christ goes far beyond this earth. It goes beyond this natural earth. It goes into eternity. So if someone is my earthly brother and he is an unbeliever, I cannot have fellowship with him. I honor him. I respect him. I treat him as nice as possible. But me and him can't have fellowship. Because our fellowship is with Jesus. And he is not in Jesus. So we can't have fellowship. You can't have fellowship if your natural brethren are unbelievers. You can only have fellowship with light and light. Because light and darkness have no fellowship. Notice earlier in Luke chapter 2. Mm -mm. Now, before we get to Luke chapter 2. Before we get there. I must live in my sanctification in my house. I must not act strangely. I must walk in love, in honor. I respect my father. I respect my brothers. I respect my sisters. I honor them. But we must not fellowship. We cannot fellowship. Because whether you like it or not, your brother or sister or mother or father that is not born again is still a child of the devil. You can't fellowship. Your first family, your first point of call is the church of God. The body of Christ. 
Fellow believers who are born again. That is your first family. Look at a simple illustration in the Bible. Luke chapter 16. Before I read, remember, your early father and family is secondary to your heavenly family. Your earthly family is secondary to your heavenly family. Some people are silly actually, carnal. Because I have seen two brothers in a church. I mean siblings. When one brother left, the other brother followed. Or a family is in church. The father left. The mother and the brother and the sister all followed their father. That's carnal. That's, that's a laugh. You know, it's a laugh. Why did you go when your brother left? He's my brother now. Why did you go when your father and mother left the church? Ah, they are my parents now. <laughs> you know, one time they came to Jesus. He was preaching. And they said, your brother, your sister, your mother, your father are looking for you. Now, in, in Luke chapter 2, when they were looking for Jesus and found him in the temple at the age of 12, he said, I must be about my father's business. I must be about my father's business. He was ministering and they told him, your mother, your father, your brothers are looking for you. And he said, who is my brother? Who is my father? Who is my mother? But these ones that do the will of my father. This is Jesus now modeling for you how to relate to natural relationships and spiritual relationships. This is Jesus, but yeah, he said, who is looking for me? Brother and sister? I don't know about what you're talking about. These ones that do the will of God are my brothers and my sisters. Jesus established the superiority of your spiritual family over your natural family. What was Jesus saying? There's a relationship higher than that one. And they didn't get angry. If you two do the will of God, you will be my father, my brother, my sister, and my, mom, my, my, my family. And why wouldn't you want to be? The church is my family of faith. The church is my family of faith. Stronger than my biological family. Luke chapter 16 verse 19. Look at something. In Luke chapter 16 verse number 19. Mm -mm. There was a certain rich man. Which was clothed in purple and fine linen. And fared sumptuously every day. Talking about Lazarus and the rich man. Lazarus and the rich man are brothers. They come from the same family. Abraham was a patriarch of the Jewish family. But you see, something was different in them. When they were on earth, Lazarus believed the word. The rich man did not. But they came from the same family. Look at Luke 16, 22 and 23. Mm -mm. Luke 16, 22, 23. And it came to pass that the beggar died. And was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. Next verse. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. And seeth Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. He saw Abraham, his daddy, afar off. Lazarus is brother in the bosom of Abraham. So, the natural relationship between the rich man and Lazarus did not follow them beyond this life. It didn't follow them. Look at verse 24 to 26 of Luke 16. 24 to 26. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, you see, it's his father. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. For I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, son, remember, son, because he's his son. Okay? Abraham is his father. Lazarus is the son of Abraham and the rich man. Son, remember 
that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things. And likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted. And thou art tormented. 26. And beside all this, between us and you there is a great goal fixed. So that they which will pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that will come from thence. So all this daddy and son was not God's business. Look at verse 27 to 31. Mm -mm. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. Next verse. For I have five brethren that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. 29. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, father, Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. Then said he unto the disciples, It is impossible, but that offenses will come, but woe unto them through whom they come. So brother, Father Abraham knew his people. He knew that nothing will convince them beyond the prophets and the message of the gospel. That means family, siblings, brother, sister, father, mother, biologically ends here. Over there, even if you are in torment because you don't believe in Jesus, your father can do nothing. He cannot help you. It ends on earth. That is why the heavenly family is superior to the biological family. Please, this is very important and this is very instructive. Natural family ends here. Who is your brother? One who has believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. One who has believed the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see, the gospel is the basis for our relationships. The gospel is the basis for our relationships. Early relationships are not eternal. They are temporal. Are we to honor them? Yes. Are we to respect them? Yes. Are we to hold our family, natural family, brothers, sisters in high esteem? Yes. Are we to treat our brothers in the flesh well? Yes. Are we to honor our unbelieving parents? Yes, by all means. But we are not to fellowship with them. We are not to fellowship with anyone who does not believe in Jesus or who is not born again. Look at those brethren of the rich man. He said they won't believe. Meaning he had fellowship. He didn't have any fellowship with them. He already knew them that when it comes to the teaching of God's word, they are adamant. Some of us get home, we just adapt and just do some things that will be compromised. When you come to Christ, you have come into a new family. I bow my knees unto the father of our Lord Jesus Christ of whom the whole family, we are in a family of God. Of whom the whole family in heaven and on earth is named. Ephesians 3, 13, 14 and 15. What about Galatians chapter 6 verse 10? Put it up for me. Galatians chapter 6 verse number 10. As we have therefore opportunity... Let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Especially. I like the especially. You know, Jesus' brothers were offended in Jesus. <laughs> in Mark chapter 6 and in John chapter 6 as well. But it didn't matter to Jesus. He told Mary to her face. He told Mary. Mary, the mother of God. He told her to her face. When you do the will of my father, then you are my brother and my sister. When you do the will of my father, then you are my brother and my sister. Wow. At least, 
I can speak of Mary, his mother, and James. They accepted the gospel. They believed in Jesus and they were saved. They got born again. Oh yes. They got born again. James and Mary. You know, somebody spoke to me who says he's a member of, of Catholic Church. Of the Catholic Church. So I asked him, are you a true Catholic? Then he said to me, what do you mean by true Catholic? I said, because there are true Catholics and there are false Catholics. He said, I've not heard of that before. Oh, yes. There are true Catholics and false Catholics. He said, well, since I've been going to Catholic church, the Reverend Father has never told me that there are true ones and false ones. I said to him, if you are a true Catholic and you believe in Mary, you will do what Mary did. And if you are a Catholic and you don't do what Mary did, you are a false Catholic. Because a true Catholic will do what Mary did. After all, it is Mary that the Catholics spend time to ask to pray for them. And if you are a true Catholic, you will do exactly what Mary did. Then he said, what did Mary do? I said, look at Acts chapter 1, verse number 14. Let's see what Mary did. <clears throat> this all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. And Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. So Mary, the mother of Jesus, was with the apostles and disciples praying for the Holy Spirit. So a true Catholic will pray for the Holy Spirit. That's number one. Number two, in that same Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Acts, no, Acts chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. They were praying, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Remember the people praying, including Mary and the brethren of Jesus. And suddenly, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. A true Catholic will speak in tongues. A true Catholic will speak in tongues because Mary spoke in tongues. The brothers of Jesus spoke in tongues. And Mark 16, 15, 16 says, This sign shall follow those that believe in my name. They shall speak with new tongues. And Mary spoke with new tongues. So a true Catholic will speak with tongues. Because that's the sign. That's the proof. And a false Catholic will refuse to speak with tongues. Why? Because he is not following the example of Mary, the mother of Jesus, who is supposed to be praying for every Catholic. So early relationships don't have an impact on eternity. It's what you do with the gospel that has an impact on eternity. Look at Galatians chapter 6 verse 10 amplified. Galatians chapter 6 verse number 10 the amplified. So then as occasion and opportunity open up to us let us do good morally and to all people. Not only be useful or profitable to them but also doing what is for their spiritual good and advantage. Be mindful to be a blessing, especially, underline that, especially to those of the household of faith. Those who belong to God's family with you, the believers. Those who belong to God's family with you, the believers. 
especially. So, there must be partiality with Christians. There must be partiality in how we treat non-Christians and how we treat Christians. There must be partiality. Not those who attend church. But I'm talking about the household of faith. I'm talking about members of God's family. God is my father. Jesus is my brother. The Holy Ghost is my comforter. The church of God is my family. Heaven is my hometown. The right hand of the father is my place of dominion. I am proud to be a member of God's family. Hallelujah. I am proud to be a member of God's family. I am proud. I am born again. I talk in tongues. I talk in tongues. I am glad to be a member of the brotherhood in Christ Jesus. That's the family of God. That's where every believer belongs. Especially those of the household of faith. It's wrong when a, Christ, when, when a church takes food. Takes food and they say they want to go and feed the poor. And they film it, snap it, display it on newspaper, social media. They are feeding their ego for PR using the poor. You didn't hear that. They are feeding their ego for PR using the poor. It's wrong. It's wrong. In, in the church, there are poor people too that should be fed. So we start from there. We start from there. You're not doing, you're not doing Christianity. You're not practicing the word of God. If you are using feeding the poor for PR purposes, that's unchristian. That's not the word of God. And even in feeding the poor, your first priority, if you are doing the word, are those in Christ. Especially, why? Because they are your concern. Believers must be treated higher and better. Believers must be treated higher and better. They must be the priority. When you're coming to church, put on your best dress. Dress well. Dress your best. Wear your best clothes. Put on your tie. Dress really good. If you have some, some cologne or some perfume, put them on. Why? You're coming for family meeting. And you honor the family. You respect the family. You don't just come to church casually. That's disrespect to the family meeting. You honor the family. You respect the family. So you are your best when you're coming to church. You are even more your best when you're coming to church than when you're going to the office. Than when you're going for business. Than when you're going to look for a job. You should dress better to come to the family meeting than you dress to go to any secular or worldly occasion. Why? Because you honor the brotherhood. You love the brotherhood. You respect the brotherhood. And you want other brothers to feel good that they have a brother like you in their midst. They want other sisters to feel good that they have a responsible sister like you in their midst. It's part of it. This is the best place to be in the house of God. There's a song we used to sing back in the days. I love to be in your presence with your people singing praises. I love to stand and rejoice. Lift my hands and raise my voice. I love to be in your presence. I mean, there's, there's nowhere to be that is as sweet as in the presence of Christ, the spirit of God, the brotherhood. It's the best place to be on earth. It's the best place I want to be always. I tell people, when I stand to preach, this is my greatest privilege as a preacher to preach and teach. Why? I am teaching and preaching to my family. I am in the midst of my brethren. I am in the midst of the church. I'm standing among the washed by the blood. I'm standing among the peculiar people. I'm standing among the fraternity of Jesus. And it's my greatest privilege to stand and address the saints 
in the light of Christ. So that is why 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Now hold on. Before we read, some of you have issues in your office with a fellow brother in Christ. Then you go to an unbeliever to report. You and a brother in Christ have a problem. You take it to an unbeliever to report. And you're asking the unbeliever, how do you think I should deal with him or her? Shame on you. Shame. Shame on you. It's funny. How many of you will take your brother to report to Boko Haram? Your earthly brother. Or you will take your earthly brother and report him to a well pronounce certified enemy of your family and ask him for advice on what to do on your brother. How many of you will do that? Nobody will do that. So why will you do that to a brother in Christ? A member of your family. I think you have an identity problem. You're suffering from identity crisis to do that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 1. Dare any of you having a matter against another, go to the law before the unjust and not before the saints. You go to the unrighteous and not before the saints. I'm not saying if someone offends you in the church or someone takes advantage of you in the church, you shouldn't go to somebody. But it should be taken to a matured believer, a fellow Christian, a child of God. Look at verse 2 to 4 of that same First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Next verse. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? Next verse. If then you have judgment of things pertaining to this life, send them to judge who are least esteemed, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. He call all natural matters, small matters. All natural problems, misunderstandings, issues among brethren in the church. He calls it small matters. Business misunderstandings. Marital challenges. He cheated me. She cheated me. He collected money from me. He refused to pay. Brother Paul calls all of it small matters. If we shall judge eternal matters, how much less small matters? Obviously, people who refuse to be settled in church have been feeding on the wrong diet. They have been eating a lot of worldly food. They have been eating a lot of unbelieving food. A lot of worldly food. That is why they are, their value, they have more value for the unbelieving world than they have for the body of Christ. They have more respect for the unbeliever to look into their issue than they have for the body of Christ. Yeah, they have more respect in that. Brother Paul rebuked that church in Corinth. And he told them, evil communication corrupt good manners. Look at verse 3 to 8 of the First Corinthians chapter 6. Please pay attention, this is very important. Know ye not that we shall judge angels, how much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you? No, not one that shall be able to judge between his brethren. But brother goeth to law with brother. And that before the unbelievers. Now therefore, there is utterly a fault among you because you go to law one with another. Why do you not rather take wrong? Why do you not rather suffer yourselves to be defrauded? Nay, you do wrong and defraud and that your brethren. 
Very clear. Rather get yourself to be wronged than to take your brother in Christ and roughly but disgrace him before the unbelievers. In Matthew 18, Jesus spoke about the disciples and the principle of dealing with wrong. He said, if you're, going, if you're going to the church to pray and you remember that you have ought against a brother, leave your gift at the altar. Go back. Go to him. He didn't say you should take anybody. You and him, go to him. Confront him on the issue. If, he set, if he's willing to settle, make peace. If he refused to hear you, look for another brother that he could respect. Two of you, go to him. He didn't say sit down and call him. He said two of you. He offended you, you go to him. That's Christ-like. We offended Christ, he came to us. You go to him. If he refused to hear the two of you, come to the church. Now the church being authority will send for him. That is Jesus. That's how to settle issues. You don't take him to people. You go to him first. You preserve his dignity. Then you bring another matured brother to him. If he refuses, you don't gossip around. Take him and bring him to the church authority. And let the church authority preside over the matter. That is the way Jesus taught to settle issues between brethren. That's under the law. Because that was Matthew 18. That was under the law. But even in Christ Jesus, look at what Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32 says. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 32. And be kind one to another. Tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God... For Christ's sake hath forgiven you. He says you must forgive. Forgive for Christ's sake. It has nothing to do with the repentance of the brother. Whether he repents or not, you forgive. Forgiveness is not tied to repentance. Forgiveness is independent of a person's repentance. The fellow may come from other churches... It makes no difference if he's your brother in Christ. The moment the person believes in Jesus, you are set up. You have to act on the word. Somebody say, I do the word. Say it again, I do the word. Say it very loud, I do the word. Say, I am what the word says I am. Say, I do what the word says I do. Can I have a powerful amen? So anywhere, they are making fun of a fellow Christian. If you laugh, you are laughing at yourself. Actually, you are a fool. Anywhere they're making fun of a fellow Christian, that's not a matter to laugh. Because that's you they're making fun of. If you laugh, you're laughing at yourself. You're laughing at yourself. And if they make fun of a fellow bro brother, they're making fun of Jesus. Remember, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? They are not doing it to him. They are doing it to Jesus. And if you laugh, you're laughing at Jesus. You're laughing at yourself. You don't mock. You don't join mockers to laugh at yourself. Because you have a relationship. You are in the house of God. And these people are your family. You have a new family in Christ. Let's examine as we close. You know, as a nation... As a nation, we have a problem. The Boko Haram menace, the insecurities, you know, it used to be the church. They started by burning churches, killing Christians. Many people refused to talk. Now it's spreading. It's gone beyond the church. It's no more just the church. It's everybody. Anybody, everybody, anyhow. And it's become a thing of a major concern. A major concern. But my constituency is the church. How will we make fun of something that is used to persecute the church? They murder fellow brothers and sisters. And we need to pray for those brethren in, in the north. We need to pray for brethren that are under severe persecution. We need to pray for them. They are our brothers. They are our brothers. If they touch one, they touch all of us. Are we in the building? Yeah. We have to pray for them. If they touch one, they touch all of us. We are bone of each other's bones in Christ. We are one spirit. 
By one spirit we've been baptized into one body. If they touch a brother in Makodi, a brother in Borno, a brother in Taraba, a brother in Meduguri, they have touched us. If they touch a brother in Yobe, or a brother in Adamawa, or if they touch a brother in Sokoto, or in Katsina, or in Kaduna, they are touching us. We don't laugh. We don't make fun. We go to prayer. We stay in prayer. Why? We pray for brethren that are persecuted. That they will have boldness to speak the word of God. That they be delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. It's our responsibility. And if we fail to pray for brethren that are in areas where there's so much persecution, it becomes our shame. Because they are members of our family. We are one family with them. Peter was in prison. The church gathered together and prayed. Acts chapter 8 verse number 5. Mm -mm. Verse 4, sorry. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Acts. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Give me verse 1. Mm -mm. Verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church. Which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Except the apostles. And it's in that same chapter that Peter was in prison. And the Bible says prayers were made for Peter by the church without ceasing. The church prayed for Peter without ceasing. For every brother in church that has been shot bombed, killed for their faith, when brethren die for their faith, something dies in us because we and them are one. When one of our brother dies because of his faith in Christ, something dies in us because we and them are one body. We are one spirit. So that's why we don't rejoice, we don't smile when we hear of persecution among the, among the brethren. We pray for them. It's like a brother of yours has been killed. When Stephen was killed, the church lamented. The church wept. And today, we have insecurity all over this nation. Believers must arise and pray. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Saul was touching the church. He was touching Jesus. Everywhere brethren are being persecuted right now, it is Jesus that they are touching. And if they touch Jesus, they touch us. It becomes our concerns. Fellow believers have lost loved ones. We need to pray for those families. You know, today we can gather here freely and enjoy Christ and enjoy fellowship and study the Bible. There are people in nations where they don't even have Bibles. They can't meet like this. They go underground. They go into caves to go and worship and, and, and hear the word of God once in a while. They don't have this kind of freedom we have. And so we pray for such people. We pray that the word of the Lord will have free course and be glorified in those areas. We pray that the brethren be delivered from wicked and unreasonable men for all men have no faith. We pray that the gospel of Christ will be accepted. That laborers will be sent to the vineyard. He never asks, God never asks us to pray for harvest. He asks us to pray for laborers. We don't have a harvest problem. We have a laborer's problem. The harvest is ripe. The fields are white. It's just laborers to go in. So we pray that laborers are raised. We pray that laborers are equipped. We pray that laborers are released to go into the harvest. In the book of 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1 to 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 1 to 3. Mm -mm. Finally brethren pray for us. That the word of the Lord may have free course. And be glorified even as it is with you. Next verse. That we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For all men have no faith. Next verse. But the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. It is not the will of God for the freedom of believers to be hampered. So we pray. Prayer makes tremendous power available that is dynamic in his workings. So we pray for brethren under persecution that they have boldness to preach the gospel of Christ. 
Look at Romans 15, 30 as I close the service. Romans chapter 15, verse number 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. For the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. And for the love of the Spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. Next verse. Ah that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. Somebody shout a powerful amen. Stand with me. Let's pray together. Let's pray for, for, for this country, Nigeria. Let's pray for brethren that are under persecution. Brethren that are in communities and cities where there's persecution against their faith. Let's pray that they be delivered. That the word of the Lord shall have free course among those communities. Father, we pray for this nation, Nigeria. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, that right now we have answers to prayer so we begin to declare in the name of Jesus from the position of victory from the position of answers we call forth that laborers are released into every man's world we pray for brethren that are in communities and states that are in cities that are under severe persecution for their faith we ask oh God for a divine intervention that the machineries and all the mechanizations of the enemy the calculations of hell be exposed uh, the strategies of the enemy fails uh, in the name of Jesus we decree that the gospel tribes uh, that the word of the Lord uh, shall grow mightily and prevail uh, we declare that in those communities the gospel is preached the word of the Lord is declared uh, men and women are coming to the knowledge of the truth uh, that brethren under persecution receive boldness to speak the word of God uh, with boldness to declare the counsel of God uh, and we declare that in the name of Jesus every strategy every divine Advice, uh, and every oppression of the spirit of death, uh, the spirit that opposes the gospel, the spirit of antichrist uh, that opposes the advancement of the church of God, uh, that opposes the advancement of the gospel of Christ, uh, that that spirit is bound, uh, that spirit is hindered uh, and opposed uh, in the name of Jesus. We take authority over every device, uh, every strategy, every working of darkness. We expose uh, anyone uh, that is involved uh, in calculating and and carrying out insecurity and threatening the peace of this nation we frustrate such strategies we bring to not those devices in the name of Jesus father you said that we pray for kings and for those in authority that we may live a peaceful life that we may live a quiet and peaceable life that God may have all men to be saved father we pray and we ask for an intervention in this nation and around the world in countries where believers are under persecution. Lord, we ask uh, that there be an intervention of God, uh, that ministers of the gospel are steered up, uh, that men and women of God uh, are raised up to speak the gospel with boldness, that they may preach the word uh, with boldness. We frustrate uh, every device of the enemy. We dismantle every setup of darkness. You spirits of hell, uh, you satanic calculation you a satanic world you unfruitful works of darkness you agents and agencies of darkness in the name of Jesus we demobilize you and we decree that your opposition is not strong enough to deter the gospel we decree that the gospel tries and tries more than ever we declare that men are coming to the knowledge of the truth women are coming to the knowledge of the truth whole communities, whole cities whole nations, whole states are taken over by the preaching of the gospel we declare that the enemy is losing grounds uh, and the church is winning uh, we declare that men and women are coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus all over Nigeria men and women are coming to the saving knowledge of Jesus even in the camp of our persecutors we 
we decree that the gospel thrives in the camp of our persecutors, in the camp of those that carry out persecution against the church. We decree that the gospel thrives, that among them men are raised to preach the gospel. Among them men are raised to proclaim the gospel. Among them men are raised to preach Christ. We break the hold of the God of this world over their minds. We pull down every device. We pull down every confusion. You the God of this world. We break your influence. We shatter your foundation. We bring to naught your devices and strategy and we declare an unleashing of ambassadors. Unleashing of ambassadors of the gospel of Christ to preach this gospel into every man's world in the villages, in the cities, in the hamlets, in the states, in the nook and corners, in the forest. We declare that believers are raised to preach this gospel like it was in Ephesus. So mightily grew the world. The world is growing. The world is growing and prevailing in the midst of darkness. In the name of Jesus. In Acts, in the book of Acts, when they persecuted the church, and threatened believers. They came back to their company and reported all that the chief priests had done to them. And they lifted up their voices to God with one accord. And they said, Lord, thou art God, who has made the heavens and the earth, who by the mouth of your servant David has said, why do the hidden rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings and the rulers have set up themselves against Christ and his anointed. But Lord God, behold their threatening and grant unto us that with all boldness we may preach your word by stretching forth our hands to heal and that signs and wonders shall be done in the name of your holy son Jesus. Father we decree for this purpose the son of God is manifested that he may destroy the works of the devil and having spoiled principalities and powers he made a public show of the devil. Therefore we decree that the devil and his cause are disarmed. Believers are being released all over the nations. Believers are being released all over the communities. Oh Kataba, that Jesus, you make a show of the church, you display the triumph of your resurrection in the church, that men and women are coming, men and women are coming, men and women are coming, in the kingdom of darkness, believers are being raised the gospel penetrates, the gospel is the power, the power is breaking into every man's world, the power of God is breaking into every man's community, in the name of Jesus, Agajokaladaba we call men out of darkness. We call women out of darkness. We call men all over the place. And we declare that all over this nation, Nigeria, we call for solution. Solution. Supernatural solution. Supernatural intervention. The wisdom of God intervening. Lako Shakata. Saviors are raised all over Nigeria. 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 Saviors are raised all over Nigeria in every strata of the society men that will preach this gospel men that will proclaim Christ they are rising and the gospel prevails the gospel prevails in the nation the gospel prevails in the camp of persecution the gospel prevails in the camp of persecution the gospel thrives in the name of Jesus thank you father thank you father thank you for answered prayer and we pray and decree tonight. We decree tonight. Massive salvation. Massive salvation. Wherever persecution has thrived. Salvation enters those camps. Preachers enter those camps. Among them preachers are raised. Preachers are raised. To preach this gospel. We decree that even among the persecutors. Preachers are raised. That this gospel is breaking down every frontier. This gospel is penetrating every frontier. In the name of Jesus. And Father, we decree that this gospel thrives in this nation. We decree peace over Nigeria. Peace over Nigeria. So that the word of the Lord will have free course. Peace over Nigeria. So that the word of the Lord will have free course. The church is marching on. The kingdom of God is advancing. And we rejoice that the enemy has lost the battle. Father, we give you praise. And we thank you for the brethren in those areas where there's persecution. Boldness in their bodies. Not just in Nigeria. All over the nations of the world. Boldness in the hearts of men and women that are under persecution for this gospel. And we decree that their voice is stronger. Their voice is louder. Their voice is stronger. Their voice is louder. They are kept and preserved. Delivered from wicked and unreasonable men. In the name of Jesus. 
Mashotola Thank you, Father, for answered prayer. Thank you for everybody connected to the service tonight. The blessing is upon everyone. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen on a note of finality. Glory to God. Glory to God. We pray for people in areas where there's persecution every day. They are our brothers and our sisters. We pray that the gospel thrives. That just like Paul, Saul of Tarsus, was arrested by the gospel and used to preach to the people that he was working with. That in the camp of Boko Haram, ambassadors are raised. That among the Boko Haram, the Fulani headsmen, preachers of Christ will rise and begin to preach to their fellows. That God's power moves into every man's world and raises an army of preachers that will preach the true gospel of Christ. It is done. We call it, we see it in our lifetime. We call it, we see it in our lifetime. In the name of Jesus. Can I have a powerful amen? What a blessing tonight, friends. What a blessing. You don't want to miss Sunday. Sunday is going to be for, for husband and wives. You don't want to miss the service at all. If you have a husband or a wife, you're a husband or a wife, make sure your, your spouse is with you in the service on Sunday. You know, it's going to be exciting. I'm going to be teaching at 8 a.m. GMT plus 1 and 11 a.m. GMT plus one, we're still dealing with wisdom for living. The relationships of the new creation is going to be explosive on Sunday, first and second service. You don't want to miss it. But remember tomorrow, next tomorrow, Saturday, we still have services at 6 p.m. GMT plus one on all various platforms. And you don't want to miss them for anything under the sun. I'll be joining Mr. Michael Bush in the next two minutes so we can answer your questions and your calls and respond to all your queries. I'd like you to grab your offerings. We want to give in faith. Grab your offerings in the house centers. Grab your offerings. It's our honor offering in response to the teaching of God's word. In the campuses, grab your offerings wherever you are. It's our honor for the teaching of God's word. There's so much instruction on how to deal with different things in the body of Christ. And we're going to look at all of them from the scripture within this series. Lift up your offerings. There are banking details on the screens, both on TV, on Facebook, and all other platforms. Radio audience, Mr. Michael Bush will read the banking details once he comes on. All right, so lift up your offerings. Let's give him faith. Father, we rejoice for the privilege to give tonight. We give with joy, we give in faith, and we thank you for the privilege to make a difference in our world. Through our giving, the gospel thrives. Souls are saved. Believers are added to the kingdom. Through the gospel, disciples are equipped all over the world. Preachers of the gospel are unleashed all over the world through, the, through, through our givings. And we rejoice that our offerings is a sweet smell before you today. Thank you for the blessing upon this household of God. We give you praise for answered prayer. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says a powerful amen. Glory! I tell you, friends, you don't want to go away. You want to stay with me and Mr. Michael Bush and myself in the other studio. It's going to be exciting as we respond to all of your issues and all of your emails. We love you guys. Remember, I did a video today on Power Bible School. It's on my Facebook page. Look for it. I did it just this afternoon on Power Bible School, both the online edition and the on-site edition. But remember, the online edition is strictly for those who have very, 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 very genuine reasons why they cannot come to the on-site, you know, Bible school. But it's very important for everybody to go get some information. Plan to be here in July. From the 1st to the 31st is Bible school. Then from the 1st of August to the 8th of August is Power City Global Homecoming. It's going to be explosive here. Third season seven. Training, evangelism, and discipleship. It's going to be a week of prayer, fellowship. It's going to be a week of impartation, teaching, training. You don't want to miss it for anything under the sun. The 1st to the 8th of August. And of course, the Bible school is from the 1st to the 31st. If you live in a quiet bomb, you can stop by our office, get your form quickly and register and prepare yourself for the Bible school. You can't be in a quiet bomb. The whole world is coming here to learn and you're not learning. Get your Bible school form. Stop by number 98, Waniba Road, Uyo, a quiet bomb state, Nigeria. I'm excited, friends. We love you till I see you in the other studio with Mr. Michael Bush. And until then, enjoy the grace of Christ. Let's celebrate viewers around the world for being a part of this service tonight. Glory! Amen! We trust Woo! that Glory. you have been blessed by this message. For these, all the messages and books by Dr. Abel Damino, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com Thank you for staying tuned. We'll just move straight to the announcement. 
that the radio audience will be waiting for bank details. The three banks, as always, there's FCMB, there's Zenith, and there's UBA. Of course, the account name remains the same. One account name in three places. The account name is Power City International. There's FCMB 2982682028. 2028. That's for FCMB, account name Power City International. The second account and uh, the second bank is Zenith 1012 36 59 12. 1012 36 59 12. That's for Zenith. The account name is Power City International, but of course. And then finally, UBA 100 39 26 465 139. 26, 4, 6, 5. Quickly, quickly. Finally, for sponsorship, just call up. Plus 234, 803-275-6104. You email Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. Dr. Day is uh, GR, of course. I'm done with those um, opening announcements just in time to go join the man of the moment, the man without whom we cannot run this uh, part of the show. I mean the entire show. It's just centered around one man. I was going to say, so the show is uh, Damina-centric, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. So, Global Buy is the on set. Um, my name is Michael Bush. I'm super excited to be here. But Global Buy is also here, international televangelist, a prolific author, and someone who just teaches the word the way you've never heard before. Help me welcome Global Baba, Dr. Abel. Damina! The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush, good evening. Global Baba, so nice to see you. What a blessing. So, so nice to see you. Praise God, how's been your day? Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. I'm on radio, I had to go sign on the program, come here. And okay, then, okay, the usual. <laughs> the magic. The usual, the usual. <laughs> so nice to see you, Global Baba. Thank you. Um, uh, we'll just pray. We'll just say the stage As usual. the ritualistic prayer. Let's pray together. Father, we rejoice that your word is flooding the nations. Hearts of men are open to the truth of the gospel. Minds of men are being rewired by the Holy Ghost through the teaching of your word. And we thank you that even where there was resistance, the resistance is collapsing. Because you can do nothing against the truth but for the truth. The word of God covers the earth as the water covers the sea. So we ask that laborers are released to the nations of the earth to teach and preach and disciple men. All over the world we declare that there's an exodus of men from darkness to light. And we decree that even in our state, our nation and other nations of the earth, our governments continue to, to be used as instruments of creating an enabling environment for the gospel to thrive. And we thank you, Lord, that your word finds free cause, even and it is glorified around the world as it is glorified with us. We give you praise and glory. And we pray specifically for ministers of the gospel that are in countries where there is heavy persecution, where there is strong opposition from the government down against the gospel we pray that they have boldness that they continue to preach with boldness we pray for strength for such ministers and for such believers and we decree that even in the midst of persecution the gospel thrives most we give you praise and glory in jesus name amen amen, amen. amen. okay Lord baba we set to go we spend the night in uh Uyo, Akwaibum state so we're going to be starting here from on this edition of the program. So I got this anonymous entry. It says, God bless you, sir. Please, I would like to know how I can see the manifestation of Jesus' finished work in my life, like, you know, in the areas of healing, spiritual growth, provision, etc. I thought that when I claimed the promises of God for my life, I would not be attacked by sickness and diseases, yet these challenges still come. So how do I live? How do I enjoy the manifestations? of Jesus' finished work. Thank you, sir, for your quick response. God bless you. Amen. Well, first of all, you must set your focus right. If your focus is seeing Jesus as a means to an end, you're already wrong. Because Jesus is not a means to an end. Jesus is the end. Once you find Christ, you find true satisfaction. You find true fulfillment. Nothing can be beyond Christ. Nothing can be better than Christ. Christ is the ultimate. And that's very important. You must be able to... Receive the gospel in a way that Christ becomes your ultimate satisfaction. Jesus said, if all our hope is in this world, we are of all men most miserable. So there is something better than money, cars, and houses, and it is Christ himself. He said to that woman, if you drink of the well, you will thirst again. But the water that I give you, you never thirst. 
Jesus is the gift of God that satisfies. However, after receiving Christ, I'm contented with having Christ. As you begin to grow in the knowledge of Christ and feed on Christ and grow in the knowledge of Christ, all of the realities of God on your inside begins to find expression. Things like your authority, things like the fruit of the Spirit, things like all that Christ has provided. Now, however, remember, your body is still mortality. So the fact that your body gets sick doesn't mean you don't have the promises of God. It just shows you that this body is mortal. And that is why this body shall be swallowed up by immortality. So while we are still in this body, we have up and downs. That's why Brother Paul said, in this body we groan, not desiring to be naked, but that mortality should be swallowed by immortality. So there's a groaning in this body because of the limitations that this body poses. However, as you grow in the knowledge of Christ, you're able to exercise authority and keep your body in the best possible way. But don't forget, it's not just reliant on your authority. There are also common sense things you do to keep this body. Remember, this body came from the dust. Therefore, it must survive by the things that come from the earth, like good food, rest well, sleep well. All of that are part of the things that helps you to live a healthy life. Okay, Global Baba, another anonymous. No, it's not anonymous. It's just anonymous in the fact that they didn't tell us where. He's writing from, but I mean, it could be jolly well be with you. So his name is Mega, or his or her name is Mega. It says, hello, Global Baba. Thank you so much for your labor of love and for teaching us the true gospel. Please pray and counsel me over my brother, Salom. He drinks excessively, Global Baba, and he's drunk almost every day. He even went to rehab for the same problem, but he only stopped drinking for a while and he started again. I also preached to him the gospel and had given him teachings to listen to several times, but he refuses the teachings and would only be interested for a while, and he's back at it again. He also went to a point of him accepting Christ, but his condition remains the same. He drinks to a point, global baba, he doesn't know where he is. Not only does he drink excessively, but he also smokes and is in debt because of his drinking condition. This started when he was 17 years old, and now, global baba, he's 31. Things don't seem to improve. Please. What can we do? Thank you, Mega. Well, as it is with all addictions, not just alcohol, all addictions, smoking, porn, and, you know, you know all, all addictions, it's all because of, you know, lack of identity, lack of an understanding of who you are. And it boils down to identity crisis. The moment you don't know who you are, you become a victim. You become um, a, a slave. You are bound. Suddenly, you cannot enjoy the freedom that is yours in Christ. So what do you do with your brother who is given to alcohol? Well, the first thing is you've got to expose him to the message of Christ. Let him begin to feed on Christ. Christ is the true satisfaction. What the guy is looking for is satisfaction. He thinks alcohol can give him. Some other people think, you know, uh, womanizing can give them. Some other people think, you know, uh, smoking will give them that satisfaction. So the more they drink, the more they want to drink, the more they drink, they have a false sense of satisfaction. And then suddenly it wears off and they go back again. So it becomes an addiction and it becomes a circle of bondage. However, when somebody begins to feed on Christ, begins to grow in the knowledge of Christ, gets baptized with the Holy Ghost, begins to speak in tongues, and begin to enjoy what Christ has provided, suddenly his need for natural things to give him that satisfaction begins to disappear. That is how to break addictions. And we have a number of people who have reached out to us who say just by listening to the things that I teach, they are free from different kinds of addictions. So your brother can be totally liberated if you expose him to these teachings and just begin to pray for him for his eyes to be open. Not just your brother, all others who are having addiction problems. That is how to free yourself from such addictions. Okay, yes, I especially like the banjo. That idea of and again and again and again. I, I thought I, I didn't know how we were going to end with that one. But this next <laughs> caller. Hello. Okay. Hello? Yes, many thanks for joining us. Where are you calling from? Hello, my name is Lou uh, Indovisi. I'm calling from Ondo State. Uh, uh, please, actually, I have a question. It's based on uh, baptism. In the book of Acts of Apostles, chapter 8, talking about the, the encounter Philip had with the token Enoch. Um, after the conversation, Philip baptized him with water. And 
and after which he received the Holy Ghost. So, but I, I followed Daddy's uh, teaching, and I discovered that he said, uh, hold, uh, water baptism is not necessary. So why should he now baptize him with water, and at the same time, he received the Holy Ghost at the same time? So that's the question. Then I'm not finished. I read some people talking about uh, some pastors maybe preaching about generational forces. Like um, maybe whereby the second son is taking over or overtaking the first son in some families. I will look at it sometimes. It appears to be true. So what I don't know, I want you to throw more light on this. Thank you, sir. All right. If you've been following the teaching, that's why I keep teaching and I say pay attention. Pay attention. Because if you've been paying attention, you will have heard a few days ago, I said the book of Acts is not a doctrinal material. And that's what we've been proving as we keep teaching. It was a journalistic account of what, how the New Testament church evolved, how it grew. So in chapter 8, they were still growing. But if you follow closely, after chapter 8, you won't see any other water baptism. Because shortly after chapter 8, Paul the Apostle came into the church and brought sound teaching. And when Brother Paul came into the church, nobody was baptizing anymore. So all of those were, were part of their growth period. And in their growth, they had what we call cross-testamental application. They carried over practices from the Old Testament. But as they grew in Christ, they dropped those practices. Remember, the prophecy is John said, I baptize with water, but the mightier than I will not use water. He will use Holy Ghost. The day of John is gone. This is the day of Jesus. Jesus does not use water. He uses Holy Ghost. So when you receive Jesus, you are baptized into Christ. You are baptized with the Holy Ghost. And once you receive the Holy Ghost by salvation, you don't need water anymore because you're already saved. It's one baptism and that baptism is receiving Christ. Okay, fantastic. I... Hello, Global Baba. My name is Prince Kalu. I'm in Potak. Please pray for me. Everything about me just turned bad. My wife left me with kids and ran away. Please, Daddy, I need words of prayers for God's mercy on my life. I think the same answer we gave to, yeah. to I don't know, what was that? there was that a phone call about listening more. Yeah. Listen to the word more. Yeah. Yeah. You could find your help Yes, there. just pay more attention to the teaching of God. So it will really help you a lot. You know, but, but it doesn't stop us from praying for you. Receive peace. Receive clarity, and in the name of Jesus, we declare an intervention in your situation. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To Abuja, we fly, that's flying from River State, we fly straight into Abuja. God bless you, uh, uh, Global Baba, and Mr. Michael Bush. Kindly explain, First Corinthians 3.17, If any man defiles the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple ye are? PMO in Abuja. What it simply means is if you get yourself into defilement, God is absent from that defilement. And because God is absent, if you expose yourself to defilement, you have a lot of things, you have consequences to confront. That's what he was talking about, Brother Paul. When he was talking about preserving your body, and he was talking about, you know, knowing that you, you carry Christ. So you don't carelessly live a life where you create a room for the devil to torment you physically. From the Namdi Azikiwe International Airport in Abuja, Nigeria, flying straight to Spain. Hello, Global Baba. Please, I really need your help. Please, I don't know what to do about um, this. I do have sex in my dream. Whenever I sleep, before I knew it, I would get wet all over, with, uh, all over my body with sperm. My name is Kelechi Augustin Duro. I'm based in Spain. I'm still single. Please, Pastor. Help me out of this one. Kelechi, there are two reasons why you have wet dreams. The first one is biological. All right. Every, every boy, every guy that grew from boyhood to, to, to youth to manhood or to being a man had wet dreams one time or the other. It's, it's biological. If you ask doctors, they will affirm that. That is part of the proof that your entire reproductive system is functional. In fact, it's just like erection. Boys have erections without any reason. Is part of establishing that your reproductive system is alive. So, and that is why mothers or fathers who observe that their boys don't have erection, they start complaining because it's not healthy and it's not normal. It's part of growth and development. However, when it becomes too much and you start having sexual dreams, it could also refer to the fact that maybe you are spending more time 
in things that are illicit movies porn you're spending time discussing with people that talk about filthy things dirty things you know erotic things you know sexual things and if you're exposed to such things there's no there's no magic you're going to have those kind of dreams so what do you do begin to renew your mind with the word of god spend more time hearing the word spend more time in the word of god and keep reminding yourself that you are the temple of the holy spirit and as you begin to feed on the word of god he said where with that shall a young man cleanse his ways by taking the heed thereunto according to god's word he says the word of god is water that washes you so as you spend more time in the word it begins to clean you of things that could be responsible in your mind for those wet dreams but once your mind is clean and you have once in a while wet dreams is part of your biology if you ask doctors they will confirm that okay from paris um in france we'll be going straight to another european stop that is spain first though we just have someone finished business back in the live studio hello your name good evening papa evening um, bless you papa, my name okay papa um this is the time to i want to cease to thank you for the word that you've been helping to build us up and one of the best things that has ever happened in my life is the interpretation of the scripture that you've made us to understand so Let's, going straight to the point, just yesterday I was passing through the street and I saw one of these billboards and they were quoting this verse of the scripture, um, this Joel 2.25 that says, and I restore to you the years that the locust, the canker one, we know the scripture. So the very first thing, um, the first thing that came into my mind was like, what is this scripture saying? Because they have been talking about the scriptures for years, so I had to go and read the entire scripture as you've taught us to read um, verses of the scripture in context, the pre-text, the post-text. So I actually went and did that. When I read, at the end of it, I came into terms that what this place was actually referring to was God restoring his people, which was through Christ. That's the concept of salvation. So Papa, I would like to know, why is it that, is it that people have, the preachers of the gospel, that they have intentionally been knowing this and they don't want to make this known to the people or they don't know at all? Now, there are two other two questions that I want to ask. So a friend of mine was talking about, um, you know, working in the supernatural without knowledge. That knowledge has nothing to do with the supernatural. So is that possible? And he equally said something today too. He said that when, if Jesus was um, talking, um, saying gibberish things, when he said that, when he mentioned the aspect of um, um, harvesters being little. So now I want to ask you, sir, this aspect of calling regarding today's Christocentric meal, how do you attest to this fact? How do you explain for them to get better that as New Testament believers that we are all called, that we don't need to hear a voice from God before we go into the ministry? Thank you, sir. All right, very good. The first question you ask has to do with pastors. Are pastors not aware of this? Well, let me be honest with you. A lot of pastors don't even know the Bible at all that they preach because many of them they didn't get any form of training. They were just full of zeal, full of excitement, and people told them you have a call. In my day, I don't know about today, once somebody is very zealous, he's always going for evangelism, always coming for prayer meeting, if they see that he's very committed, you will hear people start telling him, you have a call, you have a call. And then after the person thinks he has a call, he takes the Bible. And as he takes the Bible, he just starts saying things that sound good. Or he copies what other people are doing, and that's his own ministry. So many pastors really don't know. They don't know what you know. Many didn't have any training. And then others who are training... They, 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 some of them are not paying attention to the rules of Bible teaching and Bible preaching. They just preach what people want to hear so they can gather crowd. They preach what will make people feel good so that they can gather crowd. That's where the dilemma is. So that is why as we keep preaching the truth, it will become glaring the difference between the truth and falsehood. And people will be forced to preach the truth of the gospel. And those who are ignorant in ministry, when they start hearing the truth, you will find out that they become humble. And they begin to learn so that they too can be efficient in ministry. Then on the area of calling, every child of God is called. Romans chapter 8 says, For those he foreknew, he predestinated. Those he predestinated, he called. Those he called, he justified. So every born again believer is called. However, God brings us into the church and gives us pastors who feed us with knowledge. And when you are fed with knowledge, you grow. When you grow spiritually, the fruit of spiritual growth is ministry. You now want to preach. You now want to be a blessing to people. 
So the message that saves you makes a messenger out of you. And then Jesus never spoke in tongues. Because when Jesus was on earth, the spirit was not yet given. So he never spoke in tongues. Speaking in tongues is a gift that came from Jesus after his resurrection. That's why the first speaking in tongues was on the day of Pentecost. And from that day till today, the apostles, all of them spoke in tongues. And every believer ought to speak in tongues. Jesus said, this sign shall follow all those that believe. They speak in tongues. And speaking in tongues is, 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 is not a language of men. Now, your friend that told you that the supernatural is not taught, he himself doesn't know what he's talking about. Brother Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 says, Now concerning spirituals, I will not have you ignorant. That means there is a teaching that is required in order for you to operate in the supernatural. Global Baba, thank you. Um, I know that the second live uh, audience question is ready. First draw, I just need to go complete this trip to Paris in France. I'm still from Paris. I really am blessed by your teachings, Global Baba. I'm so thankful to God for making me come in contact with your teachings. Since I began to follow you, my Christian life and ministry have changed totally. I really honor you and appreciate the great work that you do for the body of Christ, Global Baba. Also, after a counsel from you, I began my ministry here in Paris, starting with a weekly Bible meeting on Zoom. Now it is growing. We have taken a venue and we have our service every Sunday. I would like to have a prayer and a blessing from Global Baba. Because I was being trained for ministry in a church for some five years where the real gospel was not preached. But since I came in contact with the teachings, everything just changed for me. Now I know that here in Paris, we'll take over this country and all Europe with the true gospel of Jesus Christ. So, Global Baba, can I have a word of prayer and counsel or instruction for, the, for this new mission we are beginning? Finally, one of my goals for this year is that one year from now, we will have grown well and we will invite you for a massive conference here in Paris. Thank you. Pastor Steve Griffith is in Paris, France. Wow, Pastor Steve, congratulations. I will also encourage you to join our mentoring academy. That will give you an opportunity to interact with me one-on-one -on -one every week. And it will help you as you grow. Where you have issues, you can always reach out to me if you join the mentoring academy. However, Father, I pray for Pastor Steve that he has utterance, he has boldness, he is kept by your power, and his ministry continues to find expression, and the word of the Lord grows mightily in the whole of Pari. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Live audience, question number two, and the last on this edition. Hello. Hello. Good evening, church. Good evening, Mr. Bush. Good evening, pastor. Bless you. Welcome. Global Baba, I want to say thank you for what God is using you to do. Truly, I'm blessed with your teaching. I just want to move straight to the question. What's your name? Okay. Sorry. My name is Udeben Brownson. Okay, go ahead. I just want to move straight to the question. It's about this tradition something. It's about the family inheritance, as in when the parents died, now in sharing of the property, as in the will. It happens that, uh, like, in my place, I said, before you take part, as in to inherit what your father left for, you have to, like, you know, they, you have to meet a certain demand. Like, they will call, come and give goods, come and give this, come and give that. After you, like, you cook, you know, prepare something for them. And after they say, should each of the male children should come and be giving money, you know, give goods, give this and give that. So I want to, I want to ask if truly is, is right for a believer for inside my spirit, I know that it's not right for a believer to get into such things because I see it as economic waste. So I just want uh, Kluba Baba to say something about it. Thank you, sir. When they ask Jesus that kind of question, they ask Jesus, is it okay to pay tax? And Jesus told them, get me a coin. And he asked them, whose inscription is on that coin? They say Caesar's. And he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. If that is a culture in your place and a tradition in your place, since it does not affect your, your faith in Christ, it does not affect your Christianity, you know, give it to them. But if it is too much for you, negotiate with them, talk with them, and see how you can reduce the, the economic waste as much as possible. But, you know, they will always insist you have to give them something. So give them and, and save yourself from a lot of trouble and just enjoy the peace of God. From the 
Francophone headquarters. That's the headquarters of Francophone in the world, and that's located in Paris in France. Uh, that's in Europe. I'm coming to what should be the headquarters of Francophone in Africa, Cameroon. Yeah. Hello, Global Baba. This is Skylep from uh, Cameroon. Doctors, uh, warm greetings in the matchless name of Jesus Christ. My questions are taken from First Peter 4, 6, 17, Second Peter 2, 20, and Second Thessalonians 2, 3. Who are the spirits that were being preached to? And is it the gospel message that was preached to them? What did Peter mean by judgment must begin in the house of God? And that the righteous shall be scarcely saved. And also in Peter's second epistle, 2020, who was he referring to? If these were sinners, is it possible for a sinner to have a pyknosis? Considering that was the word he used there for knowledge. Well, I'll answer just two questions. The other ones, you didn't give me the references. The first question I will answer for you there is, who are the spirits that were preached to? Well, it's a type of, it's, it's, um, Peter was making reference to the days of Noah. And the spirits that were preached to were the people in the days of Noah. They rejected the gospel, and that's why they are in prison. That's what Peter was making reference to. And then I think the second question was, um, um, was that the one judgment Peter will begin from the, the house church, of yes. God. Well, it's persecution. He means that persecution will begin with Christians. If persecution begins with us, what shall be the fate of those who do not even have Christ? So he was talking about persecution for the gospel. That's what Peter was communicating in that scripture. Okay, Global Baba is a fine place to live. Cameroon is a beautiful place to spend. Yeah, the it night. is. I know you will like Cameroon. <laughs> so we'll stay over in Cameroon. Tomorrow is another day. We come and we continue in style. Until then, okay, Global Baba, we need to say a quick prayer to, you know, for those who need yes, help. All right, Father, we pray for all those that are in need, that are connected to this broadcast right now. People that are sick, those in need of a life partner, those that are in need of fruit of the womb. We pray for people that are depressed, those that are going through challenges in their minds and in their circumstances who need a miracle. Wherever you are right now, we command the devil to take his hands off your circumstances, off your body, and your body be healed Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. We declare that you receive marital favors. Amen. And we pray for those that are married, a miracle of the fruit of the womb, Amen. receive it Amen. in the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray for students who are believing God for admission, those believing God for scholarship, receive favor and supernatural favor in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, we believe you for massive harvest of answers. Receive it now. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And okay, amen. so Global Baba, any moment now, we are on um, Inspiration FM. Yes. That runs yes. from 9 yes. until 10. 9 to 10. Then Inspiration Heritage. FM. Heritage, yeah. 10 to 12. Tomorrow, tomorrow. morning, 5.45 a.m. XLFM. 11 to 12, I'm mean 11 to 1, Radio Aquaibom, 1 to 3, XLFM, 3 to 5, you know, your FM, and we're back here tomorrow evening on Comfort FM. This is Michael Bush on their behalf, thanking you for your time and looking forward to another edition tomorrow. Global Baba, Dr. Abel Damina. The Intercontinental, Mr. Bush, what a day. It's been a wonderful one today. Well, we thank all of you for giving us the opportunity to serve you the grace of God, both the social media community and everybody on radio and on TV. We look forward to having all of you again tomorrow. Make sure you bring more people to be connected to this grace. And until then, enjoy the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and be blessed. Goodbye from Uyo, Nigeria. Amen and amen.